you just heard is from the Opus 8 collection by Biagio Marini, um, which you'll see in your handout, the title page um, appears as figure one. Um, when Marini published this enormous collection of instrumental music in 1626, he bestowed on, the on this collection an, en an equally enormous title. Um, at the very end of this title, you'll see in very fine print the phrase, con altre curiose e moderne invenzioni, with other curious and modern inventions. What does this phrase mean? Um, thinking about music, instrumental music in particular, as a site of curiosity, something that could perhaps inspire curiosity in others, but something that required collection, cultivation, study, classification. This was a new concept. Um, and Marini was obviously aware of that when he, uh, and he showed as much when he called the, uh, these pieces moderne, right, modern. Um, thinking about these pieces also as inventions requires, I think, some, some thought, and it raises a number of questions. How could music function as an invention? So inventio had long been understood as a component of classical rhetoric. Uh, it could be used for thinking about uh, theatrical performance or the kind of uh, the conceit of a story or a play. But where's the theater in instrumental music? Um, where's the meaning, in fact, right, is another, another question that we might ask. But I think that if we think about instrumental music in the context of invention and the culture of invention that existed um, in particular in Italy, but really across Europe um, at the turn of the 17th century, it helps to sort of situate these, um, this phrase, curious and modern inventions. So this was a period of instrumental innovation and invention, a period of discovery with instruments. Um, thinking about uh, you know, instances like Galileo's telescope, which he trained on the heavens in, uh, in, in the 60, early 1600s, and in 1610 published some remarkable discoveries in his Siderius Nuncius, the sidereal messenger. Um, that's just one instance of uh, an instrument being used as a vehicle of discovery. And in fact, this is a period when instruments writ large um, take on a kind of a new meaning, a new character. They are no longer merely objects to remake an, uh, an object already known or to repeat a process that had already been discovered. So the, the classical in instance of that would be a, a blacksmith right, using his tools to repeat the, the creation of an object that people already know is useful. Right? We knew how to do that already. But now in the se early 17th century, especially in Italy, um, early modern natural philosophers and scientists and collectors and artisans are thinking about instruments as vehicles of open-ended inquiry and discovery. So too with musical instruments. Um, and that's the basis of this concert and the ideas that I'd like to share with you this evening. So starting around 1610, not coincidentally I think, we see the emergence of what is arguably the first substantial repertoire of independent and idiomatic instrumental music. And by idiomatic, I mean that it was created for instruments. It cannot be always sort of um, uh, reworked to be performed on other instruments, much less on the human voice, right? This is a novel idea. Um, and you can hear in some of the pieces that we'll play this evening, this idea of an idiomatic approach to instruments. You'll hear pieces where the instruments go places that the voice simply cannot go. Um, so musical instruments, I think, like telescopes, like paintbrushes, like pens, um, like the printing press, these become vehicles for open-ended inquiry and discovery. Um, the sonata that we just heard, I think, exemplifies this in one aspect. Um, so this was a, a variation sonata on, uh, a that's based on a folk tune called the Monica. Um, actually, it's Madre non mi far Monica. Ma uh, mom, don't make me become a nun. Um, <laughs> my mom is here, so I'm grateful that that, no, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, uh, you can hear that Marini took that folk tune out of its original context, right, its vocal context, in fact, and he reworked it so that it takes on different aspects from one moment to the next, takes on a different character. 
And I think that this could be understood a little bit like the optical lenses that were used by natural philosophers, but also collected um, by patrons and uh, wealthy people who were interested in discovery, right? You could take a lens and use it to examine an object that you thought you already knew. And you could look at it from different perspectives and understand it in different ways. So I think the variation sonata encompasses some of that, uh, that character of discovery. Um, the next two pieces on the program um, explore competing points of origin for instrumental music. Um, the first is a sonata by the Mantuan Jewish composer Salomone Rossi. Um, the piece is labeled in dialogo. It's written in a dialogue or as if in dialogue. And you'll hear um, Nina with her recorder and Charlie with his theorbo will make up one half of the dialogue and Dong Myung and I will make up the other half and we'll be talking to each other. So here, Rossi seems to be proposing um, a kind of contrast, uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Rossi seems to be pr proposing a connection between instrumental music and vocal music, as if instruments can mimic the human voice and human modes of communication, like conversation. Um, in the second piece that you'll hear in this set, this, uh, it's, a, it's a big sonata by Giovanni Battista Fontana, um, and that is going to be played on, on recorder by Nina. The, the piece is wildly virtuosic, um, and you'll hear that in that instance, the recorder, again, is going places where the human voice cannot go, making enormous leaps and runs all up and down um, the instrument's register um, in a way that just transcends what the human voice would seem to be capable of.
and a little bit about Recorder before I play the Fontana, though I suspect many of you are familiar with the instrument from your third grade music classroom. Um, uh, many third graders are introduced to instrumental music making through a soprano recorder, which would be the same size as this one. These two instruments are considered transitional instruments in that they are transitional. Uh, they're neither Renaissance instruments nor Baroque instruments. The Renaissance instruments are more cylindrical. They have a smaller range. They were built in families from the smallest little soprano to the largest contrabass, which would be very much taller than I am. Um, and they would be played in families, polyphonic music, um, almost sounding like an organ when the recorder consort is really well in tune. Um, these are 17th century instruments. Uh, starting to be more, a little bit more conical parts of the bore. The range is much bigger. We now have more than two octaves range to these instruments, and they're particularly suited to this repertoire. This is an alto.
Vincenzo Galilei, the father of Galileo Galilei, wrote extensively about his own instrument, the lute. Yet he was skeptical of the abilities of other musical instrumentalists. He thought that they were illiterate and they were incapable of sort of thinking rationally about music. Um, for his son, actually, uh, it was quite the opposite. Um, Galileo was also a trained lutenist, among other things, um, and he apparently thought differently from his father. Uh, we can see this in a letter that he wrote to Lodovico Cardi da Cigoli. This appears in your handout. Open your hymnals here. Um, this is figure two. In a letter to Cigoli from June of 1612, Galileo answered a question about the relative merits of painting and sculpture. This was a hot topic of debate for centuries among Italian artists. Um, and Galileo brought a new perspective to this question. Um, what he, toward the end of his letter, he, he answered the question by addressing instrumental music. Um, so I'd like to just quote from here uh, to you. There is an imperfection, Galileo wrote, and a thing that gr greatly decreases the praise due to sculpture. So Galileo is going to come down on the side of painting as the superior art form over sculpture. The further the medium of imitation is from the things being imitated, that much more is the imitation marvelous. So in other words, painting is more marvelous than sculpture, because sculpture imitates nature, which is itself in three dimensions, right? So painting and drawing use only two dimensions to imitate nature. And here Galileo turns to the analogy with a musician. Would we not admire a musician who through singing represents the feelings and passions of a lover and moves us to have compassion for him much more than if he were to do so through weeping? So it's that literal weeping. That would be sort of strange to hear a singer on stage just weeping, right, instead of actually singing. This is because singing is a means not only different from but contrary to the expression of sadness. And tears and plaints are very similar to it. And would we not admire the musician much more if he did this imitation without the voice, with the instrument alone, with musical dissonances and pathos-filled sounds, since the inanimate strings are less able to awaken the secret affetti of our heart, the emotions of our heart, than the voice is in telling of them. So the idea is that instrumental music, because it has no words, and only uses musical devices like consonance and dissonance, is best capable of inspiring that aesthetic category of meraviglia, wonder or marvel, at uh, an artistic experience. Um, Galileo clearly had an ulterior motive in writing this, and Cigoli was involved in that motive. Um, it was in 1610 that Galileo published his observations of the moon. You can see a couple of these um, in figure three. This is again in his Siderius Nuncius, where he's using that two-dimensional medium of drawing um, and printing later in order to convey what he had seen through his telescope, right? <laughs> that the moon was not immaculate, as had long you know, been the sort of received wisdom dating back to Aristotle, but in fact, it was maculate. It had it had uh, pockmarks, it had hills, it had craters, it was imperfect. Chigoli's part in this uh, is shown in figure four, um, which is his painting on the ceiling, part of his painting of the Immaculata, or the Immaculate One, uh, Mary in other words, on the ceiling of the Pauline Chapel at Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, uh, sorry, painted between 1610 and 1612. And here you can see um, that he is, uh, putting Mary on top of a pockmarked moon. So it's precisely the, the images that Galileo records in his astronomical treatise appear, these appear in, in Chigoli's painting. Um, so art historian Eileen Reeves, among others, has talked about this as possibly the first time that a scientific discovery is recorded literally um, in, in painted art. Or, um, so the poet Giambattista Marino also uh, understood this sort of contrast between, um, between nature and artifice, right? Nature and machinery or inventions um, as a source of wonder. In figure five, you can see excerpts from his Diceriae Sacrae, the Sacred Discourses, published in 1610. 
Um, here, Marino is discussing how wonderful is the human voice, right? It's a product of the divine artisan, right? But he's describing the voice not in terms of what appears to be a natural, uh, natural phenomena, but instead in terms of the machinery that he understands as making up the human voice. So he sort of uh, dissects the human voice into its composite instruments. Um, and he says of the, of the mouth, there are so many instruments that are part of the mouth and the vocal, vocal production that are wrought with such care and subtlety and conducted from such a distance that as many parts as there are of the entire body, it seems they were only made to serve music. And next, Marino goes on to compare the voice to wind instruments, so the, the domain of, of Bacchus or Pan. The windpipe is the reed which swells from the air that draws itself from the chest and carries the breath to the throat. The tongue performs the duty of the hand, in other words, similar to an organ, right? Which closing and opening alternatively the apertures of the pipes varies and distinguishes the different sounds and delights the soul internally with the expression of conceits, concetti. And then, he's not content to stop there, but goes on to compare the mouth and vocal production to string instruments. The whole mouth, what is it but an animated lyre, where instead of strings, there are teeth, which are held to be the modulators and moderators of the voice. What is the plectrum with which the musical mind strikes the strings of this lyre, if not the tongue? Sonorous plectrum, right? Oh, tongue, sonorous plectrum, from whom, who's, from who's plucking the sweetest and most playful sound forms. So, for both Galileo and Marino, it seems that it's not the closeness of the imitation that serves to inspire this source, this this sense of wonder, meraviglia, but rather the distance, the ontological gap between the thing being imitated and the medium of imitation. And this is where instrumental music comes in. Instrumental music does not directly imitate anything. Instead, it uses musical devices and virtuosity and counterpoint and all these other kind of components of musical improvisation and composition in order to inspire that sense of, of wonder, um, what, what Galileo calls awakening the secret affetti of our souls. So I'm going to play a piece for you on my Fiorbo, uh, which I know some of you are familiar with and maybe others less so, so I thought I would give you a few words about it. It is a modified lute of the very kind that Vincenzo Galilei would have played. Uh, Vincenzo, being somewhat of a cantankerous and rather conservative music theorist, did not approve of adding strings to the original six on the lute, but uh, he was on the wrong side of history, we might say, because uh, around 1600, the long strings were added to the lute to make this sort of mutant lute, uh, which was called the chitarrone, which is just a, a rather descriptive word meaning big guitar, uh, and also the, the mysterious word, the etymology of which we don't really know, uh, called Fiorba in Italian or Fiorbo in English. Um, basically, the, the short strings play chords much in the manner of the lute or the modern guitar, and then the long strings are tuned in a scale below that. these incredibly um, low notes that really are uh, kind of at the bottom of the register that technology was capable of producing at that time. You could imagine the, the really tall recorder that Nina mentioned earlier uh, couldn't even reach this low. Th these, are, um, these are basically in roughly the same register as the bottom notes of the modern piano. Um, and the only way they could achieve that, using the physics of the time, they did not have wound strings. So this, you know, the string either had to be very thick or very long. And they opted for very long because it's, 
it sounds better, obviously. A very thick string doesn't, you know, it's like playing a rope. It doesn't <laughs> make much sound. Okay, so, uh, so this, this is the instrument they came up with. It was primarily used for accompaniment, uh, but it has a small and rather delightful solo repertoire um, of which this next piece is an example. Um, and judging by the title, it's meant to be a rather charming example. We all know this is a violin, nothing new. But if you haven't come to a lot of early music concerts, it may be a little bit new. Um, it's missing some hardware. Uh, it doesn't have a chin rest here, which vi violinists in the New York Phil hold their violin like this. They play all over the place on the violin. This violin, nowadays we call it a Baroque violin. So when it was invented, it was just a violin. <laughs> Right, it was just a violin. Um, this has gut strings on it. Uh, mine are cow gut strings, so they go out of tune very easily. Um, if you breathe on them, they go out of tune. If you put them in your fan, they go out of tune. You have to tune them often. Probably the most fun thing about this combination of violin and bow is the bow. And if you look at the bow, it is a tiny bow. We call this a short bow. First, it's a pointy bow, because it's strong at the frog, this is called the frog, and it's very soft at the tip. 
because it's so small, it can hopefully play very fast if the player is able to play fast. Um, mm -hmm. And the music here, a lot there's a lot of figuration that goes by fast. That's hard to do with a bow that someone in the near fill would use because those bows have square tips. So they're heavy on, on this end. Um, it doesn't, uh, usually a bow, you, you tighten it with a screw. If you see here, I have a bunch of pieces of leather. So again, if people breathe too much or too close to the bow, I have to add more pieces of leather and tuck, and tuck them in because that's the only way to tighten the bow. That is the technology of the time. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll tune a little bit.
thematic approach that you heard in pieces for the lute, for the violin, for the recorder, is also reflected in the keyboard music of one of the most towering figures of the 17th century, Girolamo Frescobaldi. Uh, Frescobaldi was, among other things, a pioneer of the genre called the toccata, which derives from the word toccare, meaning to touch. And that refers to the idea uh, of the, the origin of these pieces as the touch of the instrument, right? the touch of the keyboardist's fingers on the instrument. Frescobaldi makes this point explicit um, in the dedication of his first book of toccatas to Don Ferdinando Gonzaga of the Mantuan court, when he wrote, uh, and this is, let's see, figure six of your handout, having composed my first book of musical compositions upon the keyboard, sopra i tasti, I dedicate it devotedly to you, etc. He uses that phrase, sopra i tasti, the compositions emerged from his playing, his touching of the keyboard. So these pieces depend on the keyboardist's fingers, right? the habits that the fingers learn, um, the way that any artisan would learn skill by using their instrument. Um, so throughout these pieces, the toccatas, one can sense the habitus, the physical habits of the composer and the performer. Um, they're tied to the geography and the topography of the keyboard. Yet Frescobaldi was also a master of other styles, um, including counterpoint, a style of composition in which, e in which each line maintains its own independence and integrity, and counterpoint can be played on keyboard instruments, but it can also be played by ensembles. Um, yet here too, even counterpoint can be used as a vehicle of discovery. Um, so the first piece that you'll hear in just a moment in, the, in the, this, is, this next set is a, a solo keyboard toccata, but the second piece is a piece of counterpoint from Frescobaldi's volume titled The Fiori Musicali. This is one of his most monumental publications. Um, it was published in 1635 and dedicated to Cardinal Antonio Barberini. Now with a title like Fiori Musicali, this book might seem like one of the many, many volumes of music that was published in the 17th century with titles like Florilegium, right, a book of flowers, or a bouquet of flowers, or right, any number of these kind of fanciful titles that might seem to have little, little relationship to either the music or actual flowers. But Cardinal Antonio Barberini and his brother Francesco were both avid collectors of flowers, students of flowers, classifiers of flowers, right? And they, uh, they did so in the context of their own garden as well as um, the sort of gardening culture that took over 17th century Italy, Europe. Um, think about the, the big tulip bulb crash of 1637 in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but in, in Italy, there was a, and, and Rome in particular, there was a wide culture of floral collecting and study. Um, the piece that the piece of counterpoint that we'll play from the Fiori of Frescobaldi is t is based on another folk tune like the Monica, which we heard earlier. Um, this one is called the Girometta, um, and the Girometta was a, a rustic folk tune that seems out of place in the Fiori Musicali, which is mostly made up of sacred organ music. So what is this Girometta, this folk tune, doing in a book dedicated to sacred music, music for masses, in fact? Um, so the Girometta also happened to be one of those tunes that was programmed into automatic organs um, that populated the Roman countryside in gardens of elite collectors. Um, Michel de Montaigne describes visiting some of these gardens and hearing, and John Evelyn from England visited gardens and heard music coming from these automatic organs. The Girometta was one of those tunes um, that served as the basis of uh, garden music, let's say. So in fact, I think that there's more going on in the Fiori uh, than, than meets the eye, and I, I won't go into all of it. Um, but uh, here it seems that um, he is presenting Cardinal Antonio Barberini with a tribute not only to, um, to the Cardinal's interest in music, but also his interest in uh, in science and in botany uh, in, um, and in, in flower collecting and classification.
the program this evening with three pieces that highlight the array of styles that early 17th century Italian instrumental composers used. The first is a pair of dance pieces by Giovanni Battista Buonamente. Um, I think it's easy to think of such dance music as frivolous, light, formulaic, conventional, merely intended to supply the aristocracy uh, with music to accompany their social dancing. And it did all those things. Um, but I think it also bears a deeper significance. Um, in animating bodies to music, these instrumental compositions, again, capture both physical and ephemeral aspects of, uh, of musical culture. So physical aspects, including things like musical instruments, and ephemeral, including things like our affetti, our emotions, right? Um, so here, the, the, the dance music is in some ways intended to create a portrait of the people doing the dancing. Um, this is clarified in uh, the dancing treatise of the, the dance, dancing master, the dance teacher, Fabrizio Caroso, who wrote that um, Dance music is not merely an ornament. Um, music is united. Dance is united with poetry and music, arts that are most esteemed of all. And it's one of those arts of imitation that, again, the key words, represents the affetti of the spirit through movements of the body. In some, dance combines grace, beauty, and decorum, etc. Um, following this, you'll hear another sonata, this time for the full ensemble by Dario Castello, who, like Marini, wrote that his sonatas were in a modern style, the stile moderno. Um, again, an instrumental artisan by training and employment, um, Castello was nevertheless intensely conscious of what it meant to compose something modern. Um, and he makes extensive use of uh, instrumental virtuosity, that adeptness with the material in instrument um, in order to um, ascend to heights of uh, rhapsody and fancy um, and to leave an impression of modernism. And finally, we'll, we'll conclude with uh, a hit of the 17th century, Merola's Variations on the Chacona, um, another familiar harmonic progression that inspired a new wave of variation compositions.